Hi, my name is Dominic, and today I wanted to talk about what a hypothetical debate would look like between Ludwig von Mises and Noam Chomsky. Now, Ludwig von Mises was an Austrian economist that lived during the early 20th century. That's when he was most influential. And he was self-identified as a classical liberal or a Austrian economist, or today he would be considered a right-wing libertarian, representing free market values, probably would be a mainstream member of the Libertarian Party. Noam Chomsky is known as one of the most influential theorists within linguistics, after which he went on to advocate against things like the Vietnam War, became a huge critic of foreign policy. But in regard to his economic views, he's considered what's called a libertarian socialist or anarcho-syndicalist. Now, I found these two to be very influential on, upon me. I found both of their writings to be helpful, and I have found their intellect to be inspiring. So I've always wondered what would happen if Noam Chomsky went up against a, a hugely influential, one of the original Austrian economists like Hayek or Mises or Milton Friedman and so on, but we've never, we never really had that sort of debate. So I'm thinking, I go back and look at Mises and what Mises wrote. I think I found sort of a good hypothetical conversation that would have happened using their own words. And so using their own words, I'm gonna have Mises argue in favor of classical liberalism or modern libertarianism. And I'm gonna have Chomsky refute that and why he thinks right-wing libertarianism is in his own view, a very horrible way for a, for a society to exist. And then I'm going to have you Chomsky argue in favor of anarcho-syndicalism or libertarian socialism. And then I'm going to have what Mises' rebuttal to that would have been using his own words. So I hope you enjoy. Now we wish to consider two different systems of human cooperation under the division of labor. One based on private ownership of the means of production, and the other based on communal ownership of the means of production. The latter is called socialism or communism. The former, liberalism, or also capitalism. The liberals maintain that the only workable system of human cooperation in a society based on the division of labor is private ownership of the means of production. They contend that socialism as a completely comprehensive system encompassing all the means of production is unworkable and that the application of the socialist principle to a part of the means of production, though not of course impossible, leads to the reduction in the productivity of labor, so that far from creating greater wealth, it must on the contrary have the effect of diminishing wealth. The program of liberalism, therefore, if condensed into a single word, would have to read property. That is, private ownership of the means of production. For in regard to the commodities ready for consumption, private ownership is a matter of course and is not disputed even by the socialists and communists. All the other demands of liberalism result from this fundamental demand. It is thanks to those liberal ideas that still remain alive in our society to what yet survives in it of the capitalist system that the great mass of our contemporaries can enjoy a standard of living far above that which just a few generations ago was possible only to rich and especially privileged individuals. Human labor by itself is not capable of increasing our well-being. In order to be fruitful, it must be applied to the materials and resources of the earth that nature has placed at our disposal. Land, with all the substances and powers resident within it, and human labor constitute the two factors of production from whose purposeful cooperation proceed all the commodities that serve for the satisfaction of our outer needs. Two or three generations ago, even in England, an indoor bathroom was considered a luxury. Today, the home of every English worker of the better type contains one. 35 years ago, there was no automobiles. 20 years ago, the possession of such a vehicle was the sign of a, of a particularly luxurious mode of living. Today, in the United States, even the worker has a Ford. This is the course of economic history. The luxury of today is, ne is the necessity of tomorrow. Every advance first comes into being as the luxury of a few rich people only to become, after a time, the indispensable necessity taken for granted. Everything that serves to preserve the social order is moral. Everything that is detrimental to it is immoral. Accordingly, when we reach the conclusion that an institution is beneficial to society, one can no longer object to it as immoral. 
As the liberal sees it, the task of the state consists solely and exclusively in guaranteeing the protection of life, health, liberty, and private property against violent attacks. Everything that goes beyond that, this is an evil. So here, libertarian means extreme advocate of total tyranny. That's what libertarian means here. It means power ought to be given into the hands of private, unaccountable tyrannies, even worse than state tyrannies, because there the public has some kind of rule. Uh, the corporate system, especially as it's evolved in the 20th century, is pure tyranny, completely unaccountable. Uh, you're inside one of these institutions. You take orders from above. You hand it down below. Uh, you're outside the institutions under what the libertarians want. There's no th nothing you can say. The tyrannies do what they feel like. Uh, they're global in scale. I mean, this is the extreme opposite of what's been called libertarian everywhere in the world since the Enlightenment. And that's what's called libertarian here. First of all, the idea of a unsubsidized, uh, not state-subsidized capitalism, we don't even have to bother talking about that. It, it has existed. It exists in a good part of the third world, which is why the third world looks the way it does. It has never existed in any developed society for a very simple reason. The wealthy and the powerful won't allow it, just as Adam Smith understood. Uh, they will use the levers of power to make sure that state power subsidizes them. That's why the England developed. That's why the United States developed. That's why... France developed, that's why Germany developed, that's why Japan developed, and in fact every developed society has developed just that way. That's one of the cliches of economic history. Uh, the, uh, uh, so we don't have to talk about that because it's non-existent, it never will exist, except for people who have it rammed down their throats. Now, am I in favor of it? That's another question. Like in some mythical world, would I like to see laissez-faire capitalism? Well, only under the conditions described by Adam Smith. The real Adam Smith, you know, the one who wrote Wealth of Nations, not the one you worship before, but the one who wrote it. And if you look at his argument for markets, it's pretty clear. I mean, maybe the argument's right, maybe it's wrong, but it's clear what it was. The argument was, I repeat, that under conditions of perfect liberty, markets will lead to perfect equality. That's why markets are good, he said. They will lead to perfect equality, and they will not force people to subject themselves to outside orders, so they become less than human, so that, uh, you know, the artisan recedes while the art improves, as the Tocqueville put it. Yeah, if that were possible, maybe so. Uh, but uh, it's not in the cards. Well, let, let me get, begin by referring to something that I've already discussed. That is, if it is correct, as I believe it is, that a fundamental element of human nature is the need for uh, creative work, for creative inquiry, for, uh, for free creation uh, without the arbitrary limiting effects of coercive institutions, then, of course, it will follow that a decent society should maximize the possibilities for this fundamental human characteristic to be realized. That means trying to overcome the uh, elements of repression and oppression and destruction and coercion that exist in any existing society, ours for example, as a historical residue. Now a federated, decentralized uh, system of free associations incorporating economic as well as social institutions would be what I refer to as anarcho-syndicalism, and it seems to me that it is the appropriate uh, form of social organization for an advanced technological society in which human beings do not have to be forced into the position of tools, of cogs in the machine, in which the creative urge the, uh, that I think is intrinsic to human nature will in fact be able to realize itself in whatever way it will. I don't know all the ways in which it will. Uh, as to the first, small societies ex extending over a long period, I myself think the most dramatic example is uh, perhaps the Israeli kibbutzim, uh, which for a long period, may or may not be true today, really were constructed on anarchist principles, that is, of direct worker control, 
integration of agriculture, industry, service, personal life on an egalitarian basis with direct and in fact quite active participation in self-management and were, I should think, extraordinarily successful. A good example of a really large-scale anarchist revolution, or largely anarchist revolution, in fact the best example to my knowledge is the Spanish Revolution in 1936. And in fact, uh, you can't tell what would have happened. That anarchist revolution was simply destroyed by force, but during the period in which it was alive, I think it was uh, inspiring testimony to the ability of uh, poor working people to uh, organize, manage uh, their affairs extremely successfully without coercion and control. How far does the success of uh, libertarian socialism or anarchism as a way of life really depend on a fundamental change in the nature uh, of man, both in his motivation, his altruism, and also in his knowledge and sophistication? I think it not only depends on it, but in fact the whole purpose of libertarian socialism is that it will contribute to it. Uh, it will contribute to a spiritual transformation. Precisely that kind of great transformation in, uh, in the way humans conceive of themselves and their uh, ability to act, to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire. Precisely that spiritual transformation that uh, social thinkers from the left Marxist tradition, from Lex Luxembourg, say, on over through anarcho-syndicalists have always emphasized. So on the one hand, it requires that spiritual transformation. On the other hand, the, its purpose is to create institutions which will contribute to that transformation. The idea of syndicalism represents the attempt to adapt the ideal of the equal distribution of property to the circumstances of modern large-scale industry. Syndicalism seeks to invest ownership of means of production neither in individuals nor in society, but in the workers employed in each industry or branch of production. Since the proportion in which the material and the personal factors of production are combined is different in the different branches of production, equality in the distribution of property cannot be attained in this way at all. From the very outset, the worker will receive a greater portion of property in some branches of industry than in others. One has only to consider the difficulties that must arise from the necessity, continually present in any economy, of shifting capital and labor from one branch of production to another. Will it be possible to withdraw capital from one branch of industry in order to thereby more generously to equip another? Will it be possible to remove workers from one branch of production in order to transfer them to another where the quota of capital per worker is smaller? The impossibility of such transfers renders the syndicalist commonwealth utterly absurd and impracticable as a form of social organization. Yet if we assume that over and above the individual groups there exists a central power that is entitled to carry out such transfers, we are no longer dealing with syndicalism, but instead with socialism. In reality, syndicalism as a social ideal is so absurd that only muddleheads who have not sufficiently thought the problem through, have ventured to advocate it on principle. The system of periodical redistribution, redistribution of property and the system of syndicalism will not be discussed in what follows. These two systems are not generally at issue. No one who is in any way to be taken seriously advocates for either one. We have to concern ourselves only with socialism, interventionism, and capitalism.